Our next speaker is Christian Ekman, and um, he's talking about Tutankhamun's school sheet, a please design, function, and technology. Please welcome Dr. Christian. Beforehand, uh, I would like to also express my gratitude to the organizing committee for this wonderful organization of the conference, and I thank Arsi for inviting me to speak in front of you today. Thank you so much. Uh, almost needed, needless to say in front of this audience that uh, the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun uh, re revolutionized our understanding of Egypt's past, uh, bringing to light thousands of objects, including furniture, weapons, clothing, vessels, foods, chariots, and so on. Howard Carter and his team did not have the time for a comprehensive technological analysis of all what they found. This is especially true for a group of exquisitely ornamented gold sheet and leather appliques that were found scattered on the floor of the antechamber and the treasury close to the royal chariots. The appliques location suggested that they were associated with the chariots and horse trappings and are based on parallel, uh, parallels, parts of quivers, bow cases, blinkers, or parts of the chariot coverings itself. Due to the delicate condition and relatively poor state of preservation, there was not much attention devoted to this group of objects till recently. Once Carter packed them into this wooden box, the artifacts were transferred to the Cairo Museum and kept in storage um, uh, kept in storage uh, magazine. They had neither been restored nor scientifically examined since their arrival uh, in the museum. Leather coverings of chariots, leather, the leather of horse harnesses and trappings and the weaponry containers are rarely found and most are known only from images. The finds from Tutankhamun's tomb are therefore of great significance Thus, these gold sheet and leather appliques provide us with a rare opportunity to study these parts of the chariots and their associated equipment. In 2014, a joint project of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, the German Institute of Archaeology, the University of Tübingen, and the Römisch Germanisches Zentralmuseum uh, was, uh, was established. Key aspect of this project are the archaeological, technological, and scientific and iconographic analysis of these important but previously largely ignored group of artifacts. The project includes the conservation and technological examination, which was mainly done by the co-author, Katja Broschard, which we just uh, heard a lecture from her, uh, and myself, the iconographic study, which was part of a PhD thesis of Julia Berg, and presented at the Tun conference last year, I guess, already, as well as some natural scientific analysis executed by various fellow scholars, as for example, Florian Ströbele and Nicole Reifert. We are very grateful to Professor Seidelmeier, the former director of the German Institute of Archaeology, who initiated this project, cooperation of prominent institutions and museums, and um, to undertake the research work. We also enjoy generous support through the German Embassy uh, in Egypt and the German Research Foundation, which provided the, the financial means to set up a workshop of the Egyptian Museum with the up-to-date equipment. And last but not least, how could a project deal with Tut and Amon's object uh, without the expertise of Salima Ikram and Andre Feldmeier? Their broad knowledge of leatherwork and 18th Dynasty chariots is, of course, indispensable. So what you will listen today are the results of a multidisciplinary team of experts, which I'm happy to present here today. <clears throat> the reign of Tutankhamun and the period of the 18th dynasty as a whole are marked by Egypt's intensified contacts with the regions of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, 
Apart from military disputes and territorial conflicts, the, the various empires and city-states were part of a broad, late, and, uh, a late Bronze Age network of exchange and communication. Raw materials, food products, and luxury goods were traded and transported along different routes, both by land and by sea. All these long-standing international relations, both by land and by sea, uh, sorry, uh, had a huge, had a huge in impact in Egyptian culture, especially on technology and art, a fact evidenced by Tutankhamun's tube equipment and reflected also in the iconography of the golden appliques. Oh, sorry. Let us first go back to the time of Carter's discovery. After he had entered the tomb, he found within the numerous objects four dismantled chariots stacked in some disorder at the left corner of the antechamber. As can be seen from the excavation records, these pieces were scattered on and in between the chariots, respectively on the floor beneath. Uh, beneath. Additional fragments were found on the treasury together with two other chariots, this context led already Carter and later on scholars to the conclusion that those artifacts might have been parts of, parts of or related to the chariots. During the procedure of thoroughly cleaning the antechamber, Burton documented the procedure step by step. Thanks to his and Carter's extensive doc documentation, it is uh, possible even today uh, at least to partially reconstruct the, where exactly those gold sheets appliqués were lo located. So here you see one piece laying upside down, and this is the respective uh, piece uh, w within the, the artifacts. Leather casings of chariots, the leather of horse trappings, or that of weaponry containers rarely survive. Most of them are known only from depictions. Carter found that the leather was in a very poor condition due to the uh, environmental conditions on, and, and the humidity in the tomb over time. Indeed, most of it had melted into a glutinous mess. Despite the destroyed state of condition, the surviving remained to tells us a lot about the different technologies used to create these remarkable artifacts. With regard to the functional assignment, however, one easily can fi or find support in ancient depictions, as for example on the tomb of Hepo, showing the manufacture of bow cases, quivers, and other related objects. It isn't particularly surprising that leather technology already reached a high level of sophistication by this time, as can be seen here on the slide. It seems very likely that our appliques are actual remains of such kind of objects as, for example, flaps, fittings, and pieces of harness. Sorry. And indeed, sifting through Tutankhamun's tomb's equipment, we can not only recognize a comp comparable bow case, uh, that closely resembles the shape of the applique, but also it offers a strikingly detailed image of wrist guards and bow case flaps. The latter even decorated with a volute plant almost similar to the one depicted on the gold sheet shown here. Comparable material already studied and published by Andre Feldmeier show examples of chariot related uh, objects uh, con attri attributed to Tutmosis IV, Amenophis II, and III. Those pieces of trappings and bow cases are indeed of exquisite manufacture. However, they are solely made of polychrome leather pieces, whereas the tut material shows a much more sophisticated multi layer structure. A few of the better preserved appliques demonstrate that they were made of leather, gesso, textile, and gold, a topic which I, which I will address later on in more detail. Chariots were the racing cars of the ancient world. They become a significant part of Egyptian military and civil life during the New Kingdom. Hundreds of chariots must have existed at any time given. However, only a few hands of vehic vehicles survived. Introduced by the Hyksos, the Egyptians further developed them, tuning the vehicles extremely uh, 
agile and in, into efficient machines. Chariots were instantly, initially used for warfare, warfare, but soon became an integral part of military parades and state processions, hunting excursions, and finally provided a more general means to the transportation for, uh, of the elites or for the elites. Chariots' designs reflect their different uses. War chariots were late and man, uh, light and maneuverable, with the body made of wooden frames and with a leather cover. Hunting chariots were similar in design, but did not always have a complete leather casing. And, of course, the ceremonial chariot seems to have been made entirely of, entirely of wood, covered with molded and gilded, a gilded gesso formed into elaborate scenes showing the kings and gods. Particularly interesting to note is that parts of the bokehs and the horse strappings illustrated on this depiction are highlighted in yellow. It seems that the ancient craftsmen intended to highlight patterns applied to the weaponry equipment made of gold in this way. The gold sheet appliques from the tomb of Tutankhamun are decorated with an extensive repertoire of figural and ornamental motives. One group of objects depicts traditional Egyptian motives, while a second decorated with motives which are widespread throughout the Eastern Mediterranean during the second half of the second million, millennium BC and are therefore often ascribed to a so-called international style. A third group combines both traditional Egyptian themes and certain elements from this international repertoire. The appliques with the Egyptian motives, or so-called things or a lion trampling them. Both motives are symbols of Egyptian royal ideology attested since almost 3,000 years BC. Uh, several gold sheets depict the king driving over enemies in his chariots while shooting a target on the shape of an ox hide copper ingot or showing kneeling Syrians and Nubians representatives adoring the royal cartouche. Others are decorated with images of the enthroned king or are simply adorned with the royal titulary, the latter often being combined with international elements such as spiral bands or small volute plants. The international motifs, so to say, circulating in Eastern Mediterranean during the late Bronze Age are often found on small scale objects such as boxes, vessels, toilet articles and furniture inlays as well as seals, weaponry, and jewelry. The motive include animal combat scenes, symmetrical arranged capreads nippling on trees, volute plants, and spiral bands. These show di the, device, the diverse iconographic traits from the Near East, Egypt, and the Aegean. A group of gold sheet appliques from the royal tomb of Katna, a city-state in, located in uh, today Syria, for instance, offers a particularly good comparison to those from Tutankhamun's tomb, as the objects are very similar in the decoration, shape, and probably function. Small-scale objects decorated with international style motifs are attested in Egypt at least to the end of the 17th dynasty and became increasingly frequent during the time of Tutankhamun's predecessors, a period of intense international, conne uh, international connections, as I already mentioned. Tutankhamun's gold sheet appliques, together with the decorated chariots themselves and various other objects from the tomb, of, uh, from the tomb represent a, a paramount example of how originally foreign iconographic elements were integrated into Egyptian art, combined with traditional Egyptian themes and transformed into local, uh, local traditions. These rather brief and simplify remarks, however, show the great potential and the various aspects of the material on hand and offer ample opportunity to contribute further interesting input to this debate. Nevertheless, I would like to focus in this presentation on the more technological and scientific examinations. One of our major interests is targeted at the functional analysis of these appliques. Yet it is still uncertain which of the numerous objects, in total more than 100 pieces, form a group. 
Therefore, our methodological approach provides, besides the archaeological and iconographic study, extensive technological and scientific analysis. Basically, technological features are in focus here, as, for example, the chemical composition of the gold, traces of manufacture, caused by tools and chisels, the multi-layered structure of the artifacts, as well as the uh, as observations with regard to the weaving technology of the textiles that had been incorporated during the manufacture. By means of a data-based evalu evaluation, we were able to define distinct clusters of objects and achieve a better understanding of their original function. To continue with, it is necessary to understand the multi-layer structure of the gold sheets and their backings. The cross-section shows the stratigraphic layers of the textile, of the leather textile gesso uh, and then leather on top of it, and of course the gold foil which is missing here. More or less, all appliques are compo composed of this multi-layer structure by these materials. Sheet gold was commonly produced in Egypt with, and still today, by hammering small portions, portions of gold properly while sandwiched between the thin animal skin until the desired thickness was achieved. The gold foil uh, I'm talking about here features an average thickness of 15 to 45 microns only. The, outli the outlines of the motifs as well as the ornamental details were defined in greater detail by chisels and punches. Some examples reveal the use of the same chisel based on their specific shape and the wear marks. Note the characteristic and almost identical, uh, uh, ident identical shape of these impressions shown here. This enables the identif identification of distinct groups of the object that must have been manufactured in the same workshop and possibly by the same individuals. With regard to the manufacture of the gold sheets, Further observation reveal more surprising details. Looking at these two sheets decorated with goat he uh, goats heading for a tree, it seems at first glance as they were manufactured separately in an individual manner. But virtually overlaying them, however, one can clearly see how identical they are in fact. The iconographic details, in particular the dimensions of the motifs, the spiral bands as well as the plain border lines made in half relief are geometrically almost congruent. And on top of it, even a piece of today of um, a totally different shape fits perfectly into this overall design. This let us conclude that all three pieces were most probably produced in the same mattress or mold with the motives carved in before, most probably in negative. Thus, the manufacture process can be briefly reconstructed as follows. First, a waterlogged piece of leather uh, was impressed into a mold and supported by a thin layer of gesso and textile to stiffen them. After having all left to dry, the assemblage was removed from the mold turned around and the gold formed subsequently pressed and dropped into or onto the surface. Simultaneously, organic binders were applied to fix it due to the remains of glue, which could be observed occasionally on the re reverse of the gold foil. A final chiseling from the front side enhanced the elaborate de depiction and gave them their individual appearance. This procedure reflects a sort of simple serial production which is an interesting aspect of the manufacture. Indeed, the combination of leather, gesso, linen, gold, and paint is unique to the Tutankhamun's assemblage setting. It apart not only from the elite chariot leather, but also from other royal chariots. There are even examples which were, uh, where, the le where the leather framing is covered with blue and white pigments. You can see this here on the left top uh, picture. Inter inter interestingly, the only depiction of gilded leather in combination with painted blue frames is found on the object is, is found on one of the objects from the tomb itself. On the two sides and the lid of the famous painted box found in the antechamber of the tomb, 
It depicts Tutankhamun in a chariot hunting wild animals and fighting his enemies. Most attachment on the harness and decorative elements on the weaponry are shown with golden decoration framed by fruit colors. Much of the leather was impressed with different images, including geomet geometrical design, vegetal, uh, vegetal motives, animal combat scenes, as well as inscriptions, including the king's names and titulary. As I already mentioned, it, in, all in all probability, the leather was pressed and formed into molds of templates or possibly stamped and sub subsequently backed with textiles and gesso in order to strengthen it. The manufacture was completed in most instances uh, by sewing the foil, the leather and the backing together by fine sinew threads. The piece shown on the left uh, displays remains of an attachment loop on the reverse. In this case, to fix the decorative element, it had only to be slid into, it, into a strap such as the reins. Few examples show, above all, to what extent the acuteness fineness of the leatherwork frequently had been executed. A tiny, probably 1.5 millimeter thin greenish dyed leather thread was all additionally stitched uh, on the framing by using almost invisible sinew threads and thereby functioned as a decorative element as well. And threads from sinew sewn onto the leather frame by means of di diagonally orientated running stitches appear on other pieces as well. Since the gold foils and the surviving backing fragments had disintegrated into approximately 1,500 fragments over the time, it was essentially to carry out extensive sorting and joining. The condition of the object varies considerably, from very poor state of preservation to gold sheets that are almost uh, are, are more or less intact. In most cases, the organic material has almost been de degraded, the leather looks molten, and its original shapes have nearly been vanished. The overwhelming numbers of fragments showed cracks and fissures, distortions, and wrinkles. Thus, a su substantial part of the reconstruction work was to reconcile the legibility of the damaged depictions in order to make them accessible for further, further scientific study. Technological features such as tool marks of manufacture, marks of use and traces of wear had to be identified, documented and interpreted. Subsequently, <clears throat> the delicate gold foils were carefully unfolded by means of wooden tools and fragment pieces and fragmented pieces were joined together. In addition, uh, the numerous cracks and fissures had to be supported in a time-consuming procedure using tiny strips of Japanese paper that were glued onto the reverse of the acrylic resin, with acrylic resin. And here are some examples of how they looked before and after restoration. And one of the major problems was, in fact, um, the process uh, of assignment of separated gold foils to their respective backings. By means of a high-resolution di digital uh, microscope, we were able to study and identify characteristic features, uh, as, for example, impressed um, leather surface of the, of the backings. And compared those with the chiseling traces on the gold foils, you can easily identify which backing uh, uh, belongs to which gold foil. Let us now turn to the scientific analysis uh, carried out by, to identify the various materials involved in the manufacture. Basically, these analyses included the examination, examination under UV light, uh, the identification of pigments and dyes, textiles and fibers, leathers or hide, as well as glue and binding materials. Not all of them can be presented here. Some are ongoing research in cooperation of uh, or, or cooperating uh, with uh, scholars uh, like Andre and Nicole Reifert. That's why I will address just some brief remarks on only a few of these topics and focus instead on the analysis of the gold composition. The examination by means of PXRF provided analytical results that identified the different alloys of gold used in the manufacture of the, gold, of the sheet gold. It was in intended to answer the question of whether the gold sheet were made by the same 
or different manufacturers or produced from different batches or and, uh, and or different proveniences. The remarkable results display six distinct clusters of gold sheets consisting of different gold, copper, silver alloy. It is striking to see that with the only a few exceptions, each cluster is composed exclu exclusively of decorated uh, sheets belonging to one of the stylistic groups established by the iconographic analysis. One decorated with the traditional Egyptian motifs, another decorated with the, the exclusively with the motifs of the so-called international style, and a third group in which both styles are represented. The clusters depicting motifs uh, of the so-called international style show the highest gold content of 95 uh, weight percent in average. With regard to the thickness of the sheets, a similar picture can be drawn. Sheets depicting international motifs are on average twice as thick as those showing Egyptian motifs. The results once more evidences our initial assumption that the pieces were manufactured in different workshops and from several batches. As an example, we can show here or can assign three of these pieces to a group of objects which, with identical technological features with regard to their style, their workmanship, the applied tools, as well as their gold composition, they constitute an, a uniform group of objects most probably created in the same pharaonic workshop. Since these analyses delivered convincing results in identifying different groups, it was obvious to examine the cheat gold coverings of the chariot's bodies and other corresponding parts. In doing so, it was aimed to assign groups of appliques to their respective chariots. As this work is still in progress and much more complex than expected, we cannot provide conclusive results for the time being. However, the polka dotted cloud reveals a spin-off and unexpected result. The gold analysis seems to indicate that the wheels of the chariots 121 and 122 might have to be transposed or exchanged. You see here a cluster of red dots and within the red dots you, you find some blue dots from the other chariots and the opposite around is with the cluster of blue dots. I think it's uh, uh, chariot 122, whereas the other one shows 121. And uh, on which the gold foil is uh, fixed, a textile layer can be located, followed by a plaster gesso layer, as I already said, and the second layer of textile. Another layer of leather mark, uh, makes up the reverse on the backing, uh, very often uh, dyed in red. The embedded textiles are simply linen fabrics of simple or best quality. The frequent presence of spliced thread is notable and reflects a common technique for joining threads in ancient Egypt. Introducing here all aspects of our work, uh, just as detailed, would go far beyond uh, to the scope of this lecture. With the last pictures, or the last picture, I would like to point out the variety of materials we got to see within our everyday work. For instance, these remains of animal hide, which offers a possibility for the identification of the animal species. Most of them are, as far as I understood, uh, uh, are made of goat skin, um, and frequently we find some cheerful little animals uh, from the past, or I guess more or less from the storage. So last but not least, the project is indebted to many persons for their contribution and support. In particular, in particular, we extend our thanks to the director and the staff of the section of the Egyptian Museum, the restoration workshops, of the EMC and various foreign colleagues and friends who contributed with their valuable knowledge and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Oops.
Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, uh, but hopefully um, you're going to be available at the coffee break for questions.